Good morning, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome uh, as we come together in the name of Christ uh, in a virtual way uh, for this pre-recorded service for Sunday, October 11th. Uh, we do hope and we do know that even uh, with the, the sometimes impersonal nature of technology, uh, by the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, we still are able to be joined together uh, in a common spirit of unity uh, in the church, um, even if we have to worship separate from one another on an occasion like this. Uh, we do um, welcome you to our worship this morning. Uh, there should have been some uh, a bulletin sent to you by email with announcements in it. We hope that you will make note of the things going on in the life of the church. Uh, there will be um, no Bible study or no uh, services of daily prayer uh, this week. We will send out um, uh, by email the uh, services or the liturgies for our daily prayer services. So you may um, take some time uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday uh, to have some guided prayer uh, for our community and for our nation to give thanks to God and then to seek God's help uh, for our world. We hope that uh, also in two weeks you will join us for a special parking lot service um, in, uh, 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 well, in the parking lot. It, is, it will be our uh, biannual um, Kirken of the Tartans service. Uh, we think it will be a very festive celebration uh, of fellowship and of worship time. And so we hope that you will come and join us. Uh, we'll, have, um, uh, we'll have the loudspeaker system and some chairs even set up on the lawn outside of the fellowship hall. We invite you also to bring your own chairs if you want to sit by your car. And we'll have an FM transmitter that will transmit uh, from our sound system into an FM radio station that we'll let you know about and you can pick it up and listen in your car as well. Uh, and so we hope that you'll join us for that. If your family has a tartan that you would like to have processed uh, into, uh, in that service, please do bring that, um, uh, that tartan to the church uh, by the Wednesday before uh, the, the 25th of October and so we'll have, we'll have a, a good count of them and if you also um, if, if there's someone if there is not someone from your family who would be able to uh, process those tartans please let us know that and we will uh, make sure we find someone who can uh, process that tartan for your clan this is the day that the Lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it let us worship God
Our call to worship this morning is from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. You welcome me as an honored guest, and I fill my cup to, my, to the brim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life, and your house will be my home as long as I live. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may be continually given to good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Scripture is very clear when it reminds us time and again that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that no one is righteous, not even one. 
So we do come before the Lord in worship, acknowledging our sinfulness. But we also know that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so anticipating God's grace and forgiveness, uh, while we recognize our sinfulness, let us confess our sin. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses, and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. and compassionate. He does not always, he does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor does he repay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great God's love is for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, that's how far our Lord has removed our sins for us in Christ Jesus. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. difficult to come together in these days, uh, that, does never, that does not change our call to follow Jesus, our call to faithful discipleship. God does call us to be faithful in all things, including in our giving uh, for his kingdom. And so as you are able, we hope that you will continue in your faithful giving to the ministry of the church. You may send your gift uh, to the church office or you may give online uh, through our church website. But let us continue in our faithfulness to God through our giving of our tithes and our offerings. one 
Let us pray. Lord God, help us to know your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew in the 22nd chapter, beginning to read in the first verse. Hear now the word of God. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Don't you think that it's strange that in the midst of a confrontation with the religious leaders, Jesus starts to talk about fashion issues. Of all the things for Jesus to single out for exclusion from the kingdom, why on earth would he tell a story about someone who was kicked out because he wasn't wearing the right clothes. In a world where we deal with serious issues like pandemic or political gamesmanship or racism or rioting, and the list goes on and on, why do you think Jesus would call attention to the kind of clothes that a person wears? Yet that's exactly what Jesus does in this morning's parable. You can't miss it. The man who comes to the wedding improperly dressed stands out like a sore thumb, and he is unceremoniously thrown out into the street. Now we all know that the biblical image of the wedding feast is a metaphor for the kingdom of God, and so we might find it disturbing that the one person who is kicked out of the kingdom is excluded not on the basis of some moral issue or some grave sin that he had committed, but on the basis of the clothes he wears. He wasn't an adulterer or murderer. He just had poor fashion sense. Why would he be punished for that? Of course, we know that the issue is really far greater than making the wrong kind of fashion statement. As is the case with most parables, this one is full of symbolism. And the ill-clad wedding guest is but a representative of one way in which some people treat their invitation into the kingdom. Clothing is an issue, but only in the spiritual sense, that clothing represents significant attitudes concerning participation in the life of the kingdom. For one thing, clothing represents a form of identification. What you wear often identifies you with a particular group. When I was in college, there was a group of people we called preppies. They wore button-down shirts and, and, and very well-pressed khakis and penny loafers without socks. And oftentimes they had a sweater draped over their shoulders. Hardcore preppies made liberal use of the colors of pink and green. The clothes they wore identified them. It's not a judgment for or against preppies. It's just that the clothes 
were a way of identifying a a specific group of people. Clothing is a way of identifying yourself with a particular group. Do the clothes you wear, do the spiritual clothes you wear, identify you with Jesus Christ? Because I'm not talking about the shirts and the jackets and the blouses and the dresses and as you're watching from home, even the pajamas that you may have on right now. I'm talking about the spiritual garb that you are wearing. I'm talking about the kind of fashions that Paul commends to each of us when he says in his letter to the Colossians, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, and patience. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, the clothing to which Jesus refers in the parable consists not of cotton or silk or polyester fibers woven together and worn on our bodies, but of a different kind of fabric woven into our lives. It is a way of life that defines not just who we are, but whose we are. And as guests at the wedding banquet, we are to clothe ourselves in the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus Christ. The invitation to the feast is a call to rise to the occasion and to live into the new way of life that we have been given through Jesus Christ. Back when reality shows were first getting popular on TV, there was a show called What Not to Wear. I don't know if it's still on the air or not, but that was, it was What Not to Wear. And it was a show that ambushed some individual who embarrassed their friends and family with their lack of uh, fashion sense. And, and over the course of several days, the show's hosts convinced the individual of their fashion folly and they encouraged uh, the uh, individual to transform their wardrobes and even have a, a, a total makeover into, into something more update and trendy. And at the end of the show, there was this unveiling or revealing and the, and the individual got to declare with pride, look at the new me. What does your spiritual wardrobe say about who you are? Are the clothes we wear, the spiritual clothes that we wear, say a lot about us? When you say as a follower of Christ, look at the new me, do the clothes that you wear identify you with Christ? When people look at the spiritual clothing that you wear day in and day out, what kind of Jesus Christ do they see? It does matter how you live. The invitation to the wedding feast of the kingdom is more than just the ticket to get you in. When you accept the invitation, you are accepting also God's call to a new way of life. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. The fact of the matter is it is disingenuous to accept the invitation without also accepting the change in life that the invitation brings with it. The wedding guest who was kicked out is that person who refuses to change his or her life as a result of accepting Christ's invitation into the kingdom. One person noted that the parable speaks to our tendency to show up to the wedding feast without thinking much about it We have showed up with our spiritual shirt tails hanging out, lining up at the buffet table as if no one could see the ways uh, in, in which we too have refused to change. It's a reminder that there are areas of our own lives that we don't want to remove and replace with the righteousness of Christ. Sometimes our wedding clothes are inappropriate to the occasion. As people of faith, we agree that the most significant choice that we can make is the choice to make Jesus Christ our Savior. But we also know that the choice to make Jesus Christ our Savior is but the first critical choice in a series of critical choices that we will make for the rest of our lives. Faith always has ethical implications. What we believe always has ethical implications in what we do and in the way that we live out our lives. Being a Christian means more than getting our ticket to heaven punched. 
Jesus wants more than warm bodies at his banquet. He wants people committed to a new way of life. Jesus did not invite us simply to believe in him as if that moment of belief is all that matters. Jesus also invites us to follow him. And that means living a new way of life. You know, there are some eating establishments and clubs that require men to wear a jacket and tie. And in today's world, even fancy, expensive designer fashions don't always include a coat and tie. So people who who we would consider well-dressed still wouldn't be admitted uh, to those places that require jacket and tie. They could have a a $500 wardrobe on, but if they don't have a jacket and tie, they won't be let in. So people who come to those establishments and don't have their coat and tie, sometimes they are given the chance to wear a coat and tie that belongs to the restaurant or the establishment. And that way they are allowed to enter and enjoy the privileges of the club. Jesus does that for us. We are invited to the banquet. When we're invited to the banquet, the truth is we don't even possess the right clothes to wear. The clothing of righteousness is not something that we have in our own wardrobe, but it is something that Jesus custom tailors to each of us. In our Reformed tradition, we call it imputed righteousness. We are not righteous, but Jesus gives us His righteousness. But you and I have to put on His righteousness if we're going to eat with Him. Jesus Christ invites us to the banquet. Saying yes means more than getting in the door and enjoying the festivities. Accepting His invitation means that you must be willing to take off an old way of life and put on a new way of life. Proper attire is required. Are you willing to put on the clothes of Christ? Amen.
together now let us profess the faith that has been handed to us from generation to generation through the centuries, the faith that is summarized for us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us join our hearts together in a time of prayer. It is true, O God, that for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. But no matter the season, you will always be God. And so in a world that is marked by change, some of it natural and orderly, some of it abrupt and chaotic, we turn to you as the one who is constant and faithful and enduring from eternity to eternity. Hear our prayers, O Lord, as we lift them up to you. We continue to find ourselves in tumultuous times, O God. Like a ship tossed about in a storm on the ocean, we feel tossed about by the perfect storm of pandemic, election year politics, economic challenges, and profound social and racial unrest. O Lord, we turn to you and seek from you a calming of the wind and the waves. We pray that your spirit would move across the land and restore order, peace, and mutual respect. O oh, oh Lord, we pray that you would heal the sick. We pray that it's not simply for those who are infected with the coronavirus, but also for those who are struggling with cancer, heart disease, diabetes, mental health, the flu, pneumonia, the whole spectrum of chronic ailments and any other sickness that attacks the body and mind. We know that there will be no healing apart from you, O oh Lord. Hear our prayers for the sick, we pray. We turn to you, O oh God, and we pray for your church in this place and around the world. Enliven our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit and open our eyes to the ways that you call us to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to be salt and light in our everyday lives. Give us a vision of what it means to seek your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, and then give us courage to follow that vision. Fill our hearts with compassion for those whom the world considers to be the least of these, the homeless, the stranger, the poor without food or clothing, the imprisoned, the oppressed, the widows, and the orphans. You, O oh Lord, are indeed sovereign over all creation. We trust in your providence, your wisdom, your righteousness, your steadfast love. Grant that we will live each day in such confidence, boldly and faithfully serving you, glorifying you, loving you with our whole being, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. For such you have shown to us through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, including the prayer he taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace, now and forevermore. Amen.